Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, I'd like to thank the meeting organizers for inviting me, especially Professor Josiane Silar. It's a pleasure to be back in Paris and a pleasure to be with you all this morning. I'm going to talk to you about the lawn protease um, in mitochondria and try to convince you that it has some role in stress adaptation and in aging. And in order to in order to present that case, I'm going to talk a little bit also about the adaptive response model that we, that we work on, uh, that some people call hormesis, um, and also about the proteasome uh, to give you a little bit more of a background of overall proteolysis in adaptive responses. So we started several years ago trying to figure out what are the, what are, what's the broad-based series of mechanisms by which cells protect themselves from being converted from normal cells to oxidatively damaged cells, either by free radicals or various other oxidants, What's the, what are the mechanisms in between that prevent this conversion? And of course, we've been hearing already this morning about antioxidant enzymes like the superoxide dismutases and the, the peroxidases and, and all of the others. And of course, lots of antioxidant compounds, and you heard last night about some of those. Um, and we know that those enzymes and compounds try to minimize the amount of damage that goes on. There's some direct repair mechanisms. We know about some sulfhydryl reductases, for example, that can re-reduce re sulfhydryl groups that have been oxidized in certain proteins, some DNA peroxidases that can affect some direct repair. We've been working for many years on this part component of the story, damage removal and replacement or repair systems. And under here, you'd put things like the proteolytic systems, like LON that I'm going to talk to you about today, and the proteasome. Uh, you'd also put reductiendonucleases, and you'd also put things like phospholipase A2 that seems to selectively recognize uh, oxidized lipids, as shown by our dear friend Alex Savanian many years ago. Uh, several years ago, we also realized that transient growth arrest, that I think is often misused um, in measuring the responses of, of um, proliferative, proliferatively responsive cells, you often see studies that look at, at, at a growth arrest as being a bad thing. In fact, it turns out that what we think, and we've shown, I think, that in uh, many models of cell proliferation, that transient growth arrest is a protective mechanism. The cells go into growth arrest for a few hours purposely, and in fact, GAB45, GAB153, and ADAPT15, a gene that we discovered several years ago, are all turned on to protect cells against oxidant stress by making them go into a transient growth arrest where the DNA is supercoiled and protected and, and protein synthesis is dramatically turned down. So I think there are a lot of studies in the literature that have looked over the years at the measure of whether cells are proliferating or not. And you'll often see on the, on the y-axis viability. And it's not viability most of the time. It's whether or not the cells happen to be dividing during the period that you're measuring. So I'll, I'll leave that alone for a while, but I'll be happy to answer questions on that because I think we've missed it a lot. In addition to all of this, there are what we call adaptive responses. And these are transient uh, adaptive responses that enable cells to cope with a short-term stress and survive and, and continue. And we've been working over the years to show that untreated cells, if you add a little bit, our model is largely hydrogen peroxide as our oxidant, a little bit of peroxide actually improves cell growth. And many people have seen this over the, over the years. And we're talking largely nanomolar levels. A little bit more peroxide, low micromolar, high nanomolar levels will cause a, a, a temporary growth arrest. We're talking a couple of hours here. And then cells can go through a transient adaptive response during which many genes are turned on, many other genes are turned off. And then they're protected for a short period of time. They then lose that protection, and they go back to being naive cells again, as if they'd never seen the stress. And in fact, you can take them through rounds of, of adaptation, de-adaptation, multiple times uh, over a period of, of, of days. If you go too far, you add too much peroxide, obviously you get damaged, but we don't want to go down this route. So we're interested in short-term or transient and reversible stress adaptation, sometimes called hormesis. It's important that it's reversible. Um, otherwise, you might just be selecting for a pre-existing population of resistant cells. So our experiments largely are of, this, of this, these kind, where you have control cells, and you have a, perox a peroxide level that's a challenge level that will cause a problem for cells that you have to find. Then you find a low peroxide level or a pretreatment in, in a third condition, wait for several hours, and then add a high peroxide challenge, the same dose that you used here, and now see whether or not these cells will be protected. So you've got four different sets of cells. And when you do that, here's an experiment uh, in yeast because they stand out better on, on a screen like this in lights. Uh, here are control cells. 
Here are challenged cells, and you see that you lose a lot of the cells. Here are heart peroxide pretreated. The pretreatment doesn't cause any problems. In fact, they might even grow a little better. And these are both pretreated and challenged, and you see that the pretreatment has enabled these cells to grow perfectly well and to be happy. This works in everything from E. coli through yeast through all sorts of mammalian cells to multiple human lines. This is actually an old slide. We've done many more cell types since then, and it works in all of them. It also works in large organisms like, like uh, worms and flies. You can do it in whole organisms. And whether you measure cells by a fix, by measure uh, success by a fix and stain technique or a clonogenic uh, assay, you can see that if you don't pretreat, cells do this, and if you pretreat, they, they, they co cope with the stress very well. The adaptation really works. Uh, it's a short-term adaptation. As I say, it, it peaks at about 18 hours after the pretreatment is added. That's the time of maximal resistance. After that time, you lose, you gradually lose resistance, so that by 30 hours, these cells are naive again. And if you add another pretreatment at this point, you can take them up again. They'll come back down again, and so on. And we've gone through many rounds of adaptation, de-adaptation, to show that this is an interesting genetic response. It turns out that both inhibitors of transcription and translation will affect this process, will diminish this process, and it also turns out that the expression of 50 to 60 genes, depending on the cell type, and I'm talking about mammalian cells now, um, 50 to 60 genes are upregulated during adaptation, and another 50 or 60 others are actually downregulated. Uh, we're focusing so far on the upregulated ones. So which genes are induced? Uh, many antioxidant enzymes, DNA repair enzymes, protein degrading enzymes, both proteasome and LAN, that I'll talk to you about today, a number of signal transduction proteins uh, that were all previously known. And over the years, we also discovered a new gene that's or previously unknown gene called ARCAN1, as regulator of calcineurin 1, that seems to play an important role in regulating this process. ADAPT15, that's a member of the GAD family, growth arrest and DNA damage. So there's GAD45, GAD153, GAD ADAPT15, all turn on transient growth arrest. And that's why we think they're protective. And then these others whose role we don't really understand yet, but we'd like to. So what proteolytic enzymes are used to degrade oxidized proteins and which of those are upregulated? I already told you that both LAN and proteasome are. Uh, I'll tell you, show you a couple of slides on, on proteasome. So LAN inside mitochondria and proteasome in multiple forms in the rest of the cell, both the 26S proteasome, which is 20S with two 19S regulators attached to it, found in the cytoplasm, also close to the end endoplasmic reticulum, also found in the nucleus, also free 20S proteasome, and we think that's a form that degrades a lot of oxidized proteins. Also a, a form of proteasome called the immunoproteasome, which is a modified 20S, often with 11S regulators bound to it. I'll come back to immunoproteasome and 11S regulators, unlike 19S regulators. We'll come back to those later. So these are the kind of proteolytic enzymes we're, we're interested in that, and that we find are modified. And this is a, a summary slide. I'm going to show you two summary slides on proteasome and then get to, to uh, lawn protease. Um, so what we're finding, and this is, this is work that was done with Tilman Gruner's lab a couple of years ago, we're finding that during an oxidant stress, uh, 26S proteasome, and that's this form here, the 26S proteasome that has a 19S regulator on each end, actually falls apart. And it seems to be a process that's catalyzed by Two, pro two other proteins, ECM29 and HSP70. We're not exactly sure of the mechanism yet. But during this situation, the 19S regulators come off and stay bound to HSP70. So that's what you see here, HSP70 binding 19S regulators. And HSP70 seems to preserve the integ integrity of the 19S regulators for a period of hours after the stress is induced. There we go. Um, and during this period also, 11S regulators can actually come along and bind 220S proteasomes, as shown here, uh, in place of the 19S, and actually improve 20S proteasome recognition of oxidized proteins. So we think this does a number of things. One of them is that it gives you a lot more 20S proteasome, some of it bound with 11S, that's better at degrading oxidized proteins than is the 26S proteasome. So you're able to get rid of the oxidized proteins quickly. After a period of a few hours, however, you need 26S proteasome again in order to be involved in protein synthesis because it actually is involved in, 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 in cleaving a number of different proteins and processing them. And you, during that period of 15, going, going up to 15 hours now, make a lot more 20S proteasome. You also make immunoproteasome. You make more 11S regulator, and that's shown by having more of all of these turned on. So this is a short-term activation, and this is 
alteration of gene expression during this 15-hour period. Uh, it turns out that the induction of the 20S proteasome, uh, as well as uh, a number of its subunits, uh, as well as the 11S regulator, is actually conducted by the NRF2 system. So NRF2 is the signal transducing system that turns on the 20S proteasome its synthesis and the 11S proteasome uh, regulator. And normally, NRF2 is kept bound to keep one and keep the whole keep one complex as part of a, a ubiquitin ubiquitinylation system that ubiquitinylates NRF2, gives it to the 26S proteasome and causes its destruction or degradation, and that keeps NRF2 levels pretty low in cells. One of the things that this whole new system that we're describing does that's part of a new paradigm in NRF2 activation is that you need 26S proteasome to degrade the ubiquitinylated NRF2. During this period of three to five hours after the oxidant stress occurs, you no longer have 26S proteasome. It's been dissociated and the, the, because the 19S regulators are bound to, to uh, HSP70. And so there is no 26S proteasome to degrade NRF2. And that's part of why we think NRF2 levels actually rise. So this is a new part of the NRF2 story that 20, the, the lack of 26S proteasome during this short period leads to a rise in NRF2 levels and that plus also its phosphorylation causes its translocation of the nucleus and turns on the production of 20S proteasome and 11S proteasome that binds as a regulator. The immunoproteasome is actually induced by a different system, not by NRF2, and I won't have time to talk about that today, but it goes through a different pathway. So proteasome is all part of the story and part of the proteolytic response to, uh, uh, in, in adaptive responses. Now what about in mitochondria? Um, so mitochondria need to be able to degrade oxidized proteins also. They have no proteasome. Uh, if, we, if you remember, the proteasome picture that I showed you is actually four rings that make a cylinder, four rings stacked one on top of the other. And it turns out that we showed a few several years ago that uh, LAN protease is primarily responsible for degrading oxidized proteins. And the LAN protease is like one of the rings of the four ring structure of the proteasome cylinder. It's not the same proteins involved, obviously. And in fact, you find that there are repeats of either six or seven subunits, they're all identical, that make up a, the ring structure of the LAM protease. And proteins have to go through the center of this ring in order to be degraded. If you look at the structure of LAN, shown here, in the, in the absence of ATP, it's in this sort of constricted state. In the presence of ATP, it's open and can degrade proteins. And in fact, that's shown a little better here. Minus ATP, it's constricted. Plus ATP, it's open and available to degrade proteins. So unlike what many of you have heard me talk about over the years, that the degradation of oxidized proteins by proteasome is, turns out to be mostly ATP independent because it's by 20S proteasome or by 20S plus 11S regulator, the degradation of oxidized proteins by LAN is actually ATP dependent or ATP strongly stimulated, and it involves ATP um, uh, degradation or ATP turnover. So here's the degradation of oxidized aconitase. Here's non-oxidized aconitase, and gradually more and more oxidation. You get to a peak of degradation. This is, this is the degrading activity, and much better in the presence of ATP than without ATP, and the reason why is, is straightforwardly shown here. There's no ubiquitin story with LAN. It's just a simple opening of the ring or closing of the ring. If we look at uh, down-regulating LAN, and this is, these are old, older experiments where we were using oligonucleotide LAN antisense oligos, and here's normal LAN, here's LAN that's been oxidized, and, and in the presence of ATP, you can see tremendous degradation. Uh, if you knock LAN down, you lose that ability of mitochondria, so the mitochondrial main enzyme involved in this is, in fact, LAN. If that's all true, then you'd expect if you knocked LAN down over a period of several days, that you get an accumulation of aconitase, and that's exactly what you see here over a period of, of several days, LAN in the presence of, of uh, sorry, aconitase in the presence of LAN antisense, LAN uh, aconitase accumulates over time. In fact, you get to a peak, and after this, aconitase is so modified that the antibody stops recognizing it anymore, so you don't, you don't continue to increase, but we've shown by other means that the protein is actually accumulating and cross-linking. So it turns out that LAN is, just like proteasome, LAN is not static. LAN is, is very responsive to oxidant modification and to stress. And in the mitochondria of young animals, especially during heat stress, uh, serum, uh, food starvation, or oxidative stress, LAN is highly inducible. 
These are experiments we published a couple of years ago showing these are different levels. Each color represents a different level of, of micromolar uh, per, uh, hydrogen peroxide addition. And then we're looking at one, four, seven, or 25 hours after the exposure. And you can see you can get as much as about a ninefold increase in lawn protein. That's a tremendous increase in protein levels um, in, in mitochondria over this period of time. If you look at the mRNA, however, in, in the best response, we're getting about 1.5, 1.6-fold increase in mRNA. So very, from the very beginning, we had this sort of clue that perhaps this is not such a, such a trans, uh, transcriptional story, although that's only very preliminary evidence that that might be the case, but a very large increase in lawn protein during this period of time. Uh, this is uh, 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 heat stress over here, lawn in comparison with HSP70, uh, and here's serum starvation. So lawn is a, is a stress-inducible protein by multiple different stresses. Here's the induction of LON over that period of time. If we use the LON, if we use the LON SI RNA, so we're switching now from antisense to more recent experiments with SI RNA. This is a couple of years ago, actually. Um, we can see we can block that. And over here, if we're looking at carbonyl content as a measure of oxidative damage to mitochondrial proteins, you see that with, uh, with, when, we, when we just had hydrogen peroxide, these were the levels that weren't very effective down here, not inducing much LON. We start getting carbonyls being produced. But if we use this level, where we got 1 to 200 micromolar, where we got great lawn induction, then we get very little increase in carbonyl. So it prevents the increase in carbonyl. On the other hand, if we use lawn SI RNA, then the carbonyl content goes right up because we couldn't induce lawn. So it is protective against this uh, oxidant stress. If we look at uh, viability in terms of direct cell counts or MTT analysis, again, inducing lawn is protective against the stress and lon siRNA blocks that protection. So it's both induced, uh, diminishing uh, carbonyl content, and also protective. Uh, is, it, is it transcription or translation? I gave you a clue before. So here, if we look at actinomycin D to inhibit transcription, we can find that we can actually decrease the, the transcriptional activation of lon. It's not a big activation, as you see. You see a little bit of lon mRNA increase, but it has absolutely no effect here on the lon protein level. So lon protein is increased whether you have transcription of lon or not, of the lon gene. Uh, but if, in fact, if you use cyclohexamid to block translation of lon, then in fact you block this induction almost completely. So it's a translational activation. It's not a transcriptional activation. And we're now working, trying to work on the mechanism of translational activation, very different than the proteasome story um, and not involving um, a uh, signal transducing system in this case. Uh, LON, it turns out, is a lot more complicated than I have been telling you so far. It's not just a straightforward protease. Uh, it actually is a protease during stress when it comes off the mitochondrial genome and goes into the mitochondrial matrix where it can recognize oxidized proteins. But most of the time during non-stress conditions, LON is actually bound to the mitochondrial genome and it's bound in the D loop of my, the mitochondrial genome where it's absolutely required for mitochondrial biogenesis. So if you, if you knock LON down, mitochondria will stop proliferating because they need LON for that proliferation step. And it doesn't seem to be because of its proteolytic activity because we and others have actually been able to knock down the proteolytic activity selectively and you still can get mitochondrial biogenesis occurring. But if you, if you knock down LON, uh, altogether, then you lose biogenesis, you lose proliferation. So there's something different going on about LON here. It's another fascinating story, but not, for, unfortunately, with time for today. Um, we hope to find out more in the future. So we've been interested in, my, in aging for a long period of time. I work in a school of gerontology, so I have to be. And uh, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> and, um, we're working on, we've been working on the question of protein lipid and DNA repair systems in oxidant stress and sort of revisiting this whole free radical theory of aging uh, for a number of years. This was a paper back in 1990 in gerontology where we were trying to expand it from the simple idea that, that you have oxidative stress during aging to whether or not repair systems or damage removal systems were involved. And it turns out that in aging and oxidant stress, there's a, 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 there's a problem with, with lawn that you can demonstrate. We did this study with Holly Van Raymond where we used heterozygous uh, SOD mutants, these are mitochondrial SOD mutants, that have some problems in life. They survive, but they have problems. And we had four sets of animals, young SOD uh, wild type, old SOD wild type, young SOD heterozygotes, and old SOD heterozygotes. And if you look at the levels of lawn protease, what you'll find is that these are the protein levels lower in the, in the old animals, 
lower in the heterozygotes and much lower in the old heterozygotes. And here's the proteolytic activities of LON. They follow exactly the protein levels. It turns out that if you look at LON mRNA, which had been done several years ago by Rick Weindruck and Tom Prola, they had, they had actually found that they weren't looking for LON, but the most decrease uh, mRNA in skeletal muscle in mice in aging is actually LON mRNA. And we, didn't, we weren't aware of that study when we started ours, but it all now fits. If you look for evidence of oxidative damage, you can see in car looking at carbonylation, depending upon how long you, you, um, uh, you, you use the, uh, the Western blot, that there are multiple proteins, but the main one that comes out right away is, is actually a conotase, but there are many, many other proteins. So that's a cautionary lesson for, for doing these things. Tillman and I, many, Gruner and I, many years ago, looked at protein oxidation and proteolysis with proteasome in aging tissues, looking at either senescence or non-proliferating cells. Um, and when, we started, when I started to look at this in my lab with LON in senescent cells, here showing you early passage, middle passage, or late passage cells uh, shown by uh, beta-galactosidase, what we can see is that the late passage cells have diminished LON levels to start with, so they have a lower LON level. If we look at lawn inducibility, if you remember back a couple of slides ago, I showed you how inducible lawn was. We got this ninefold induction over a short period of time. When we try to do that with the mid young, middle, and, and senescent cells, what you find is the senescent cells are not able to induce lawn, and they have lots, sorry, they, they, this is not the induction, this is the straight levels. So they're lower lawn levels, and they have lots of carbonyl proteins. When we try to do an induction experiment, I got ahead of myself. This is the, the uh, low passage cells, the young cells. Lon's very inducible over a short period of time. In the middle passage cells, we get only a little bit of lon induction, and we start getting carbonyls being produced early. Then as the lon levels rise, the carbonyls are brought back down. In the senescent cells, or very late passage cells, there's basically no lon induction, and carbonyls start high and go even higher. So a lack of ability to induce lon is uh, is characteristic of these senescent cells. And then here we were looking at uh, old cells, old skeletal muscle cells taken from old mice. And what you find here is that the lot inducibility is dramatically reduced in those cells. So in aging, uh, lot induction, high lot expression normally protects cells against oxidant stress. That's carbonyls or division of survival. Lot induction provides oxidant stress protection against multiple stresses. In the presence of, of LON siRNA or antisense, LON can't be induced. When it can't be induced, there's a much smaller increase in stress protection. And older cells, whether dividing or post-mitotic so far, gradually lose the ability to induce LON with stress, and that seems to, to predispose them to greater damage. We're looking at this as part of a bigger story of adaptability in aging, short-term adaptation, uh, where we see a decreased cellular adaptability as a general characteristic of aging. Decreased proteasome, subunit and regulator induction, decreased mitochondrial LOM protease, decreased ADAPT genes in general, and mostly most of the other shock and stress genes also at a lower level of inducibility. Um, this was Jean Calment, who lived not here in Paris, but here in France at least, as far as we know, the longest lived human being, at least carefully documented. And the question with many of these things that we're looking at is whether or not uh, this is the decline that we're looking at is a cause or effect. Obviously, we're leaning more to cause than effect. And in terms of the free radical theory of aging, we, we think we need to, to modify, to, to expand this theory out a little more now to say that it's, it's not just uh, damage to proteins, lipids, and DNA increasing over time, especially in the last third of lifespan. Um, that's come out in the last few years. Diminishing mitochondrial function may be increasing electron transport, uh, sorry, leakage. Inhibition of damage removal and repair systems, which we've been working on for many years, but also by diminishing adaptational capacities, and other people here might be able to add more to this list, but I think this is a more reasonable uh, view of, of the free radical theory of aging these days. In the proteasome studies that I showed you, especially Andrew Pickering was involved, Tilman Gruner as collaborator, John Tower, Derek Seaberth, and Henry Foreman, and in the lawn protease studies, Jenny Ngo, uh, Daniela Bota, Laura Corrales Diaz Pomato and Alison Coop, and our studies with uh, aging mice were done in collaboration with Holly Van Raymond, and we've been supported by the NIH. And I thank you for your attention.
questions, could you please tell us a little bit more about this function of loan or mitochondrial genesis, which is dependent? Yeah, so thank you, you, you bet, on, you bet on, the, on, the, on the appetizer. Um, I wish I could tell you a lot more about it. I can only tell you a little bit more about it. And, and other people in the room are probably in a similar position. Bertrand Friguet and, and Tillman also uh, have all been interested in this question. There are a number of people looking at this, um, and nobody really understands it. All we know is that if you knock out um, and you, uh, by, by uh, selective mutation the, the active site of LAN, then you, you, you lose the proteolytic activity. It retains its DNA binding activity and retains its ability to be permissive of proliferation. I say permissive because we don't yet know exactly what role it plays in proliferation, but there are a number of other groups looking at this at the same time. Uh, I wish I could give you a much better answer. I can only give you that little bit. But yeah, it, it, is, it is a real tease. And, and exactly why or how uh, is really not clear. And we thought at first that it would be straightforwardly a proteolytic function. That, you know, I mean, the simplest explanation you come up with is there must be a, an inhibitor of mitochondrial proliferation. That's a protein that, that's a DNA binding protein that long cleaves. By cleaving that inhibitor, you allow proliferation. That would be great, except when you knock out the proteolytic activity, you still have proliferation. So, as long as long binds. And it turns out that when LON, the only other part of this is that during stress, obviously LON comes off the, the mitochondrial genome, is degrading oxidized proteins, and at that point proliferation stops dead. Thank you. Just to follow up on that question, so do you have any idea if it has anything to do with the transcription of the mitochondrial? We do, uh, whether if, you, if you silence it, do you see any change in the mitochondrial? No, it's not, it's not a straight transcriptional story. No, it's, more, it's, it's something more than that. No, I don't think so. Good question. <coughs> yeah, I want the activity because you think about protein labels and stuff. Like yeah. That. So the activity is tricky to assess. Do you have any good idea to, to look at that because it's the activity which is the Yeah, so there are a couple of new inhibitors out there, which as you know as well. Um, so LANA has been very difficult to work with because unlike proteasome where there are, well, it, even with proteasome, there are no specific inhibitors, but there have been fairly selective inhibitors. And what the field has come to is sort of the idea that if you use three or four of the selective inhibitors and they all give you the same story, then you're probably looking at the right thing. Plus, now that you can knock things down and then look at inhibitors, you get a better story. With mitochondria, it's more difficult because some of the proteasomal inhibitors actually inhibit, inhibit LON also, and some of them don't, so you can get a partial story. Now there's a, there's a couple of new inhibitors that, that have come out recently. Um, uh, is it from the Wang's lab? I forget her name. Yeah, I think it's Emily Wang. Um, the, there's been two papers out that have suggested that these inhibitors are, are very specific for LON. We're, we're now in the middle of testing them. Uh, we actually had another inhibitor that Daniela Bota, who's now at UC Irvine, and she had a, um, a synthetic chemist there produce an inhibitor, a potential inhibitor that we're working on. So there's some real hope that LON inhib inhib inhibitors can be specific, um, but we're just at the beginning of that part of the story, so it's not, it's not as nice as we would like it yet. Yeah, it's great to do the molecular biology with, with knocking things down, but you really want a good old-fashioned biochemical inhibitor to get the final story, I think. And the two together is very powerful. Maybe I have one question. You, you mentioned that uh, load can be induced by hydrogen peroxide. Is this true for any kind of oxidant, such as singlet oxygen or one electron oxidant? So we, we don't know about singlet. We haven't looked. Um, we know that it's inducible by superoxide. Sorry, by, sorry, wrong. Hydrogen peroxide. Uh, by heat stress, by serum starvation. I didn't show you cold stress, but cold stress also works. Um, there's some indication that shear mechanical shear stress uh, can also induce lung, so that's of interest in blood vessels, for example. Um, we have not looked, uh, sorry, we did peroxynitrite. Peroxynitrite induces lung. Uh, we've not looked at anything else so far. And I, I, Bertrand, have you looked at, uh, wake up, Bertrand. Have you looked, have you looked at any, have you looked at any other oxidant induction of LON? We, we've done peroxynitrite, peroxide, and a bunch of other physiological stresses, but I don't know about other oxidants. Yeah, we've, we've done the hydrogen peroxide. Peroxide too, yeah. yeah. So that's, I think, all we know so far. 